morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Mid City Bible Church here. Glad you're able to come out this morning. I trust the Lord uh, has shown himself a blessing in the previous week. Uh, he's always there for us, he's always there beside us, and he's always there to lead us. And uh, so we have a blessed Savior and Shepherd. And so we have the chance this morning to worship together. We have just a few announcements here. And so we always like to go through. And just to make you aware, if you're a visitor this morning, we have uh, connection cards for our visitors on the seats around you. Uh, be sure to fill one out if you would like, and, and uh, put your email there, and, and just put it in the box at the back of the room here. And we'll be able to get in touch with you, and you can also put any questions you may have about our church. Also, here's the information about our website, as well as our YouTube pa uh, channel and our Facebook page. So you can follow along. Uh, we have a QR code there again. You're able to connect with this, take your phone, grab that QR code, and then you can go in and sign up with the Realm. And this is just a secure social network where within the church we're able to communicate prayers and praise and events that are going on as a church body. Daily Word, portion of God's Word, you can follow along each day. It's provided on our Facebook page and on our website as well. Men's Breakfast. Now, we always have a great time. We have Men's Breakfast first Saturday of every month, and this next one's going to be September 2nd. Plan to come on out. We're going to have a good time. We always do. We have a good time of fellowship, encouragement, and I uh, always look forward to those. And uh, Danny's been heading that up, and the uh, Lord just blessed and used him and keeps using him. Stop Human Trafficking. We have the Poirier and Foundation. It's a ministry that we've been involved with there in the North Texas region and getting the word out and pictures out of those missing children here in our area. And uh, praise the Lord, we went out last time just the week before, seven, seven of those children had been found and rescued. Continue to pray uh, for this, though. It, it, human trafficking is going on here in North Texas. We place those flyers, distribute them. A lot of churches in North Texas are doing this, and we go out the second Saturday of every month. So this next one you'll see there on the 9th, and we get here at 10 o'clock. We go out. We're usually done by 12.30 or 1, but we go out to, on different routes to different businesses and establishments, and they put those pictures, those flyers up, so if they see one of these children, their pictures are on there, they call this anonymous tip line. Continue to pray. If you can't go out with the flyer distribution, pray, pray for the Lord to use this ministry in rescuing, rescuing those children. And pray for their salvation. They need to come to Christ. That's really important. Amen? Amen. So let's prepare our hearts for worship. God is good. God is love. For God so loved the world the whole world, not just my world. God so loved every person in this world and sent Jesus to teach us what love looks like. Pyar s'enchine pour ta haine. L'amour est plein de bonté, l'amour. Et l'amour no es envidia. Vif de pronti. Lupos nider hilsa. Sarang eden chilpe ga opta. L'amour pa egois. Tình yêu sẽ chẳng dễ dàng nóng giận. Since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. To love every person, every nationality, every background, every history, every soul. Because in life, we find faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Stand together here with us. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your great love. Thank you how you demonstrated that love by sending your son, Jesus Christ. That he would come and die as a sacrifice for sinners like us. That we may be redeemed 
we might receive eternal life, that we might be born again, born of the Spirit. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Lord Jesus, we, we worship you. We worship you as your people. We unite and gather here to lift your name high, to sing praises to you, to seek you out and to hear you from your word. Our time of fellowship together, Lord Jesus, you make it possible for sinners to know how great this love of God is, how great the grace of God is, and that we know mercy. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your faithfulness, your love, and your protection each day, and your guiding hand. We pray this now, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King Rise among us, let it rise. Oh, 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 let it rise. Oh, 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 oh let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us let the songs of the lord rise among us let the joy of the king rise among us let it rise oh, 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 let it rise Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, 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 oh. let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, 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 oh let it rise. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind, there's no one like you, none like you. Into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you, none like you. 
Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer. Awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Amen. We can have hope, right? have confidence and have joy because he is powerful. Amen. Shalom. Shalom. May the peace of God be with you. Shalom. Shalom. May the peace of God come over you. Shalom. 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 Shabbat. Shabbat. Shabbat, may the rest of God come over you. Shabbat, 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 Shalom. May the peace of God rest in you, Shabbat, Shalom. May the peace of God come over you, Shabbat, Shalom, Shabbat, Shalom, Shabbat, Shalom, Shabbat. Shalom, shalom. Well, Heavenly Father, you have sent us the Prince of Peace, the Messiah, Yeshua, 
the Lord Jesus Christ, your King. In Jesus, we know peace because we have been declared righteous in you. Because you bore the cross, died for our sins, and you rose again. We serve you, we follow you, and we love you, Lord. Thank you for the peace and the rest that we have in Christ. Thank you for the Holy Spirit dwelling in us and his work, producing that fruit of the Spirit of love, joy, and peace, kindness, gentleness, long-suffering. And Lord Jesus, we owe all to you for all, and we praise you. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Well, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Brett Bacon. I had the uh, tremendous honor and privilege of serving this church as an interim pastor uh, for, uh, for six months. And prior to that, I got to preach off and on here. So it is a tremendous joy for me to be able to come here and give the ministerial and pastoral charge to your new pastor, Pastor George. Now, when uh, several months ago, when we ordained deacons in this church, uh, I wrote, uh, I, I did a charge to our deacons as they assumed those duties. And I said that day, I said, deacons, I'm preaching to you, so I'm, y'all listen to me. Everybody else, you just get to listen for fun while I talk to them. So the same thing's going to happen today. George, I'm preaching to you today, okay? Uh, there'll be a little part for the congregation at the end. I don't want to leave y'all out, you know. But generally, I'm preaching to you. Everybody else, y'all get to listen in and have fun, I hope, and be encouraged and be challenged. Um, I'm going to go off my script a little bit uh, before I start. Uh, it's better for me to, to go off the script in the beginning. What I, but what I do want to talk about for you, George, the role of the pastor is a role that is just chock full of contradictions and chock full of pressure. You're going to be asked to study God's word and yet walk among people. You're going to have to understand both good and evil so that you can preach rightly regarding both. It's a tremendous burden. You're going to have to pray for the congregation when you don't feel like it, when you're under attack, and when you're miserable, and when you feel good, and when you think things are going so good you don't need to pray. Uh, I told you, congregation, there's going to be a part for y'all, too, and it's going to be prayer, so I'm just warming you up. <laughs> it's, you're going to walk in two lands, the kingdom above and the kingdom here, and you're going to have to discern both. It's not easy. So, church, pray for your pastor, because it's, a, it's an enormous task. As we get into the scriptures today, you're going to see a little bit of how enormous it is. And uh, I told George in advance, George and I had lunch on uh, was it Thursday or Friday? It was Friday. We had lunch on Friday. And I told George exactly what I was going to preach. We're going to do Titus 1. We're going to do 1 Timothy 3. And I know y'all love it. We're going to do Ezekiel 34. <laughs> I, have, I have stoked in this church a love for the book of Ezekiel, I hope. So we're going we're gonna to dig into Ezekiel 34 as well. That's going to be the longer part. Well, let's get into uh, let's get into the beginning of it. I call this the posture of a pastor because a pastor is going to be inclined in multiple directions, just like we spoke of. So this is lovely. I love a good word study because I'm a you know I'm a seminary student working on a doctorate, so you know word studies are kind of my thing. Um, the word pastor uh, is tied, and I wanted to give you all this. I'm not going to read it all to you, but it's tied to the word shepherd. Now, when we think of shepherding, we think of helpless critters. We think of someone who must protect them and feed them and guide them. And so this idea of the, the noun function of pastor is tied to this idea of being a shepherd. And we're going to see that in the scriptures in Ezekiel 34 in just a minute. But I wanted to make the grammatical tie here 
because all of these functions, and you can see these here, this ministering, this herding, this guiding and protecting and feeding, all of that is in the role of the pastor and of the elders. Sorry, elders, you're not off the hook. I'm preaching to y'all today, too, because we do believe in a plurality of elder, eldership because, you know, the Bible says so. So we're going to do that. So we're doing that, too. So, yeah, you guys thought y'all were off the hook. You're not. You're still on the hook. But I want us to have an idea of this word. It's more than just an office. It has within the nature of the word the tasks that go with it. And I think that's really important. So uh, I said this a minute ago. The pastor's task is a little complicated. The pastor has to serve God and live an authentic Christian life. We're going to see this in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. The pastor must also serve his family while he serves the people of God. And make no mistake, there will be demands of both at the same time. And your pastor is going to have to make a choice. Every pastor does. Every elder does. The pastor provides a worthwhile example of how to live the Christian life. So it is not enough to proclaim it. It has to be modeled. You have to be able, you should be able to look at your pastor and say, that's what a Christian looks like. Uh, Hebrews 13, 7. The pastor serves the people under his care. The pastor is accountable for how well he cares for them. Ezekiel 34, Hebrews 13, 17. The pastor must study and proclaim. Sorry about the verb problem there. Uh, the pastor must study and proclaim the scriptures. So you're going to have to study it, know it, and speak it. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to do it right. Y- y'all may not have noticed this. The Bible's complicated in English. Just wait till you see the Hebrew and the Greek. It's complicated. It is not an easy task of study to rightly divide God's word for God's people. George, that's on you. You got to be a good student. The pastor is to be postured toward the study of God's word. We're going to look at 1 Timothy here in a second. Now, I want to say this all the elders, elders, all of you, sorry, Bill, I'm still looking at you because, well, some of that's because you're in the center, but, you know, all the elders must be able to teach and preach God's word. Elders are to exhibit a character that is consistent in the scriptures. We're going to see it in just a minute. Elders who labor in preaching and teaching on a regular basis are deserving of a special honor, 1 Timothy 5, 17. You can look that up later. And remember that when your budget comes up. <laughs> let's, look at Titus, uh, let's look at Titus 1. This is ver- these are verses 5 through 9. So let's talk about Titus a minute. We love Titus. Uh, Titus is uh, assisting Paul, and Paul has sent him at this time to the island of Crete to establish pastors and elders in the churches he visits. Pay attention to the grammar in this passage. It's really important. The reason I left you in Crete was to set in order the remaining matters and to appoint elders, plural, in every town, singular, as I directed you. I do that on purpose. Whenever the elders are referred to in the scripture, in Titus, Timothy, and Acts, they're always plural, always plural, never singular. Okay? The church didn't get into singular person leadership until we became the Roman Catholic Church. Biblically, it's always plural. So this is good news at this church because you believe in elder leadership, and it means your pastor, your preaching pastor, does not stand alone. He's got good men that stand next to him and that are rightly able to divide the word of truth and live a godly example. And I know because I know these guys, (laughs) and they're just wonderful. An elder must be blameless, the husband of one wife, with faithful children who cannot be charged with dissipation or rebellion. For the overseer must be blameless as one entrusted with God's work. Pay attention to the bottom part. This is going to come up in Ezekiel. Not arrogant, not prone to anger, not a drunkard, not violent, and not greedy for gain. Instead, he must be hospitable, devoted to what is good, sensible, upright, devout, and self-controlled. Anybody intimidated yet? This is a big job. Oh, and by the way, uh, by the way, Christian, not pastor, you're not off the hook. You're supposed to look like this too, by the way, because Jesus looked like this, right? But I want to pay attention to the bottom. George, this is for you. He must hold firmly to the faithful message as it has been taught. 
so that he will be able to give exhortation. That's a, that's a Bible word for encouragement, positive thing. So that he might give encouragement in such healthy teaching that he corrects those who speak against it. See, there's a lot of bad preaching out there that engages what is bad and doesn't expound on what is good. And if I'm reading this correctly, and I hope I am, Paul's telling Titus that, uh, that when these guys, these men you appoint as elders, stand up and preach, they are to be generally positive and encouraging and giving God's word and the gospel as it has been taught because it will correct what's wrong in somebody's heart because the Holy Spirit's good at that. See, the pastor is to be the conduit for the spirit to the people. The elders are to be conduits to the people of the spirit. Does this make sense? We need that as church followers, as church members. I need to be encouraged. I need to see good examples. Good news for y'all. You've got great examples and great guys here. This, is, this should be very encouraging. George, you ought to be scared to death. If you're not scared to death, you will be in two more seconds. So. I want to say this also, the pastor, the pastor, in addition to being postured toward God's word, he has to be postured toward people outside of his care. Those outside the church are to be invited into the kingdom in Christ. The elders must have a reputation. All of you, you're not, a, uh, it's all three of you, so. The elders must have a reputation that makes that invitation welcome. The devil is seeking to destroy and discredit the gospel, and the preaching elder is always, 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 always his target. Don't ever think you're not. He's never not aiming at you. He's never not, elder. He's never not aiming at y'all. Because it's good strategy. Why derail 60 people when you could derail one and take 60 with you, right? Let's look at 1 Timothy 3, and we'll see this. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. This is a trustworthy saying, Paul says to Timothy. If someone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a good work. So you should underline that in your Bible. I'm sorry I didn't underline it here, but the role of the elder is a good job. It's good to be an elder. And Scripture says so. The overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, and able teacher. Anybody, does that look familiar to anybody yet? That's what we want, right? We want God's Word to be consistent across the charge, okay? And you're going to see it again in a minute when we, when we dive deep into Ezekiel. Able teacher, not a drunkard, not violent, not gentle, not contentious, free from the love of money. Free from the love of money. Why does he say free from the love of money? Because it's alluring. Of all the sins on here, that's the one that's the most seductive in our society in 21st century America. The love of money. Because it leads to all the others. Right? You can't have a drinking problem unless you have the money to drink. <laughs> right? You don't get opinionated and cantankerous with people unless you feel you've been wronged, and that comes from entitlement, which comes from a love of money in a lot of ways. It's fascinating to see here. He must manage his own household well. Does he have to manage his household perfectly? No. He's got to manage it well. He's got to manage it well. He's got to keep his children under control. Children. Children. Not adult children. <laughs> this Greek word here is specifically the younger ones. Why does it say that? Because the older ones are accountable to God themselves. When the little ones are in the house, they should be reined in. God save us. <laughs> You're off the hook. You know, young kids in the house. See, he's like, Phew, dodge that one. <laughs> Good for you. For you aspiring pastors in the room, watch out. You got to have, you know, it's part of the gig. And look at Paul's argument. Because someone does not know how to manage his own household, how is he going to care for the church of God? Because the church of God is way more complicated than the kids in your house. You know the kids in your house. You have seen the experiences that have shaped the kids in your house. The people of God, you will not know everything that is shaping the people in this church, George. You can't. They're going to have pressures and experiences and wounds that they're going to bring here. You're not going to know them all. Okay? 
but you have to care for them anyway. And we'll see that in a second. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become arrogant and fall, here we go, into the punishment that the devil will exact. See, the elders are under fire from the evil one. The great part about this passage is it lets us know that the devil is on the hunt, okay? And it tells us that elders can't be recent converts or they're going to be especially vulnerable. But the attack is constant. That's why the elders in this church have walked ministry mileage. You know, they've walked some miles out. And I want to look at the last. And he must be well thought of by those outside the faith. So they might, may not fall into disgrace and get caught by the devil's trap. Because many have a good reputation in their church and a poor reputation outside of it. And when that happens, the gospel is unattractive. And the leader does not have the credibility to invite people into their church or their gathering or their small group. George, you got a big job. You got a bullseye on your back. You got an enemy who's a good shot. That's why you don't ride alone. You have the body and you have your brother. It's a good thing. God set it up that way for a reason. Here we go. Let's talk about Ezekiel 34. Uh, I know Ezekiel is a book that a lot of folks don't read very often. You're missing out. It's one of the coolest uh, prophetic books in the Old Testament. Uh, church, say amen if I've taught y'all that. If y'all love the book now, good. Yeah, y'all making me happy. Making me happy. This section in Ezekiel is very unique. It is the most leadership-centric chapter, I think, in the entire Old Testament outside of a couple of chapters in Nehemiah. What's happening in Ezekiel 34 is that the leaders of the nation have been unfaithful to God, and they have been abusing the people in their charge. But when God speaks to them, to these corrupt leaders, to correct them, he uses the language of shepherd and sheep, which I think has great ramifications for the 21st century pastor in the New Testament. Because what we see in this indictment are God's expectations for the shepherd, and we see what he will not tolerate when it comes to mistakes by the shepherd. It's a very, very important chapter. But we see it, and again, like, like, and Paul does this too. It's one of the, I think it's one of the reasons Paul does it. You guys have read the, Paul's letters, and you'll see he has this list of good things you need to do, and he has this whole list of bad things that you're not supposed to do. But part of the bad things is that, okay, I need to do the opposite of that, right? Your kids are yelling in the car. You turn around and you tell the kid, you know, stop yelling at your sister. But what you're really saying is be nice and talk kindly to your sister, right? or something close to it, and it may just be, sometimes it may be hush up or whatever, but, but my point is, we see in the indictment the expectation, so we're going to walk slowly through these verses real quick, we're going to spend some time in here, and this is, this is a solemn charge, so this is Ezekiel speaking, he says, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. So you already know there are two sides, right? Shepherds on one side and God on the other, and that's a problem because the shepherds are supposed to be on God's side. And God has just declared they are not on his side. So let's see what not being on God's side looks like. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat, and you clothe yourselves with wool, and you slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. What's this a picture of? Remember the cartoons when we were kids? Who, who sneaks in to steal sheep and kill them and eat them? 100%. This is a wolf picture on the shepherd. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. Eat the fat, clothe yourselves with the wool, and slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. You are exploiting the people. Make sense? Here's the charge. Those who are sickly, you did not strengthen. The disease, 
you did not heal. The broken you have not bound up. The scattered you have not brought back. Nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and severity, you have dominated them. What does God expect from the shepherd? The shepherd is supposed to strengthen the sheep, just like we saw in 1 Timothy 3. But that's not all. God is expecting these shepherds to heal those who bring in diseases. He expects the shepherds to help with those who get injured. Now, those who are injured are different than the ones who have diseases. A disease is a long-term standing health problem. An injury is something that is painful and acute in the moment, or for several moments. But the shepherd's task is to minister to both. The disease you have not healed, the broken you have not bound up, and the scattered you didn't bring back. So when people left, you didn't go after them to bring them back in the right way. You only brought them back to eat them. God's indictment. And then he says this. This is a comment on management. But with force and severity, you have dominated them. That's a severe indictment. Because Jesus doesn't look like that because the Father doesn't look like that. And the Father has different expectations for his shepherds, plural. And he says this, they were scattered for lack of a shepherd because what they had was a wolf. They were scattered for lack of shepherd and they became food for every other predator because they were scattered and not together. This is going to get rougher. God says, my flock. Whose flock? God's flock. Whose flock? Make no mistake, elders, shepherds. You are stewards and not owners. Because God says, it's my flock. They are my people. And there's a problem. My flock wandered through the mountains and on every high hill. My flock was scattered across the surface of the earth. And there was no one to search after them and go after them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord as I live, declares the Lord. This is not going to be good. Surely, because my flock has become a prey, my flock has become food for beasts of the field for lack of a shepherd. And my shepherds did not search for my flock, but rather my shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. The Lord says, behold, I am against the shepherd. Shepherds do not do the tasks that are God's heart for the flock. God postures himself against the shepherds. Be absolutely warned. Be absolutely warned. To harm the bride is to draw the ire of the bridegroom. And God is serious. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds. And I will demand my sheep from them. And I will make them cease from feeding sheep. You're not only out of a job and out of a position. You likely end up out of your life. So the shepherds will not feed themselves anymore. But I will deliver my flock from their mouth. So that they will not be food for them. Here's the cool part. If you keep reading Ezekiel 34. God's going to tell Ezekiel. I'm going to set my shepherd over them. My servant David. Ezekiel 34 is not just an indictment against wicked shepherds. It's a promise of the Messiah. It's one of the reasons I love this chapter so much. The pastor, the pastor is to be postured toward the people in his care. The people inside and outside the church are going to have all kinds of complicated wounds. George, some of them self-inflicted. I would argue most of them self-inflicted. And it's going to be your job to minister to those wounds. Elders, it's going to be your job to minister to those wounds. The honorable shepherd must be committed to help and heal the pain of those in his care. You're going to guide them into health. 
we talked about this at lunch a little bit the other day. The good shepherd guides the, the people into health, not into happiness. Yeah. Into health. Because happiness cannot withstand the weight of the world that will crush it. It has to be health. So it has to be the smooth and the rough parts of Scripture both. It's not just eternal life in Christ, which is amazing, but it's living for Christ, like Christ, while we're here. God's shepherd is to minister to these wounds with tenderness and not with severity. This is a character choice. This is a style choice. How you pastor reflects your heart. Everybody's leadership style reflects their heart. I have a, my master's is in Christian leadership, so I talk on leadership topics a lot. It's one of the reasons I love this chapter. But I have not met a leader yet whose inner workings weren't reflected in how they tried to lead people. So keep an eye on the inner man because it's going to affect how you do the job. And it's not a job, it's a life. It's a life. God shepherd has administered those wounds with tenderness and not with severity. Or he risks both losing his position, which is what we just saw. I'm going to take my flock, my flock, from, the, from these shepherds. But you can lose your position and risk God's judgment. And I would encourage you to look at Revelation 2 for that. Revelation 2 I have, I have learned to my chagrin, I've probably taught Revelation chapter 2 badly for the last 20 years. All, most of the U's in Revelation 2 are singular and not plural. It's not the letters of seven churches, it's the letters of seven pastors. And those indictments are to pastors who have gone astray. In Revelation 2, 5, God says, you need to clean this up or I'm going to come take your lampstand away. You're going to lose your flock because I'm going to put them with good shepherds. Because that's what God does. You scared yet? Yeah, you should be terrified, mortified, yeah. You should do it anyway. <laughs> okay, church, you got it. You're, here you go. Congregation, come in. This is for you. Hebrews 13. Uh, Hebrews 13 is a great chapter. It's, uh, it's starting to finish out the book of Hebrews. So the writer is firing all kinds of these little wise statements. But there's two that really pertain to the pastoral task. And I think they're important. Uh, Hebrews 13, 7. The author says, remember your leaders who spoke God's message to you. Reflect on the outcome of their lives and imitate their faith. Which means the pastor has to have a faith worth imitating. The elders have to have a faith worth imitating because the eyes of the church are on y'all. Congregation, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls. Look at this language here. For they keep watch over your souls and will give an account for their work. The Lord is going to hold them accountable for their work. Let them do this with joy and not with complaint, for this would be of no advantage for you. It does not help the pastor to have a church that beats him down. It does you, the church, no good. Let them do this with joy and not with complaints, for this would be no advantage for you. Now, in case you're wondering what remember your leaders means, he's going to expound on it here. Pray for us. Who's the us? The writer and whomever else are leaders. For we are sure that we have a clear conscience and a desire to conduct ourselves rightly in every respect. That should be the goal of the elders. Conduct ourselves rightly in every respect with a clear conscience. So congregation, you got a job to do. You got to pray for your pastor. Because he's got a big, big, big task. And it's not just writing sermons every week. I had an easy job. I was the interim pastor. The elders led this church. I showed up once a week, preached a sermon, and we interacted, and we did other things too, but that's easier than what a permanent pastor has to do. He has to do all this other stuff too that we just talked about. 
it's a it's a tremendous task you still up for it you game that's what i'm talking about all right so george why don't you and your wife come up if you want to sit on the or sit on the orange couch uh, is that where we're feeling good sit stand how do you want it andy Andy's, in Andy's always in charge. Who else? <laughs> All right. Yeah, once you sit. Once you sit. You got bad knees. Once you sit. Lori, come with me. I don't know if George has bad knees. I'm just saying. So come up and sit down. And we're going to invite the current elders to come up and the deacons, if you guys want to come up. And Bill, you're a former elder and we love you, so we're going to invite you to come up. And we're. In James, we anoint, lay hands, and pray. Now, I didn't bring any olive oil, so we're not anointing you today, so you're off the hook on the oil part, but you've been commissioned as a pastor already. Are we going to cut me off? I don't need a mic. I'm, I'm not cutting up for you. Just be real. So we're going to take some time, and we're going to pray for George and Laurie for this journey they're about to go on. Now, a lot of y'all know George has pastor before. Uh, he's, he's done this task before. I think it's wonderful that as a congregation, you guys have chosen George to be your lead pastor. I think it's terrific. I think it's terrific. It's a statement to his credibility and good ministry that he's done here, and it's a statement to y'all for having wisdom and are following the Spirit's leading. So I'm going to start us off, and then I guess David will just go around. And you could tell we rehearsed this before we got here. So I'm going to pray. <laughs> Lord, we love you. What a what a neat day. What a neat day. It is a testament, Father, to you as the faithful shepherd that you have now appointed a new shepherd over this flock. It is because you are good and you are kind that you have chosen George, who is good and kind. Someone with a track record of ministry and kindness and good study and he's got musical talent too and that's awesome it's just a bonus prize but this is a testament to your faithfulness Lord and your kindness Lord this is a great day for me because I get to see the transition and it's amazing so Lord be with my buddy thank you he does not serve alone that he serves besides, beside great elders and deacons, deacons who are passionate about serving, elders who are passionate about leading and serving. Lord, guide George and Laurie through this journey. Be ever close to them. Lord, when he starts to run out of gas, let him call on you. And Lord, when he can't call on you, poke him in the gut and have him call me. because I want to watch this journey. Lord, thank you for George and Laurie. Thank you for what they've given to this church, what they're about to give to this church, for the past and the present and the future to come. Thank you for being a God of all authority. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Father, Lord, we just thank you so much. Firstly, for the servant heart of Pastor George and Lori. And Father, we want to lift up their marriage to you, the relationship that they have with each other, and most importantly, the relationship that they have with you. I pray for wisdom over their, their marriage. I also pray that you, who have continued to watched over them and lead them, Father, that they would uh, always look upon you and your word for the direction in their life and for wisdom. For you said, for anyone who lacks wisdom, they just need to ask. And you will give abundantly to them. And Lord, I, I pray that on those long nights where uh, George may still be preparing for his lessons while Lori just wait patiently and maybe give him a hot tea when he needs it 
Lord, I just pray for those nights that you would give him wisdom. I pray that you would come upon his life and let him know how much you love him. And Father, we love each one of them so much and we are grateful for their heart to serve you. With every beat of their heart, with their last breath, they will honor you and praise you and serve you. So, Father, we thank you that you have given us a precious gift. Lord, we ask that you would bless them abundantly and continue to lead them. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I too thank you. Thank you for the truths that Brett has shared the challenges that he shared. And Father, I'm thankful that uh, George is willing to take on those challenges. Father, uh, as I've looked at his life, I can say that um, although he's just now being recognized and being authorized as a full pastor, it's what he's been doing all along. God, I thank you for him and uh, Lori, for the team that they are, while they support and encourage one another. Father, we pray for wisdom as they resist any uh, wiles of the devil and that they would be quick to cling to your word, um, quick to uh, call for counsel when required and uh, Father I thank you that you provided in all these ways Heavenly Father I just thank you for the ministry of George and Laurie up to this point and Lord specifically I'd ask that you can do both of them with the power of your love with wisdom from above and from the blessings of knowing that they have those around them who are willing to help, that they'll trust the leadership, the elders, and abide solely in your word as they walk with you and lead this church with you. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing George and Laurie to us, and uh, it's been a blessing uh, to us. It's been a gift, and uh, just to serve alongside George and, and now to serve with him. And uh, I just pray that uh, you may wrap your arms of protection around them, uh, keep the em enemy from them. Uh, you know, in the times that they feel uh, feel under attack, Lord, I pray that we can circle the wagons, and uh, I pray that as as elders and deacons, we can we can keep an eye on the gauges, and uh, I just thank you for this time that we are we can uh, bring George and into uh, into the leadership of this church and. And just pray for strength for him and Laurie, and uh, as they as they guide this church and uh, congregation. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God told us when He gave me my strongest gospel presentation. There's one thing that will get you through the good times, the bad times, and everything in between, and that is that. God loves you. To always remember, never forget. As a church, we are God's team. And you have been um, God has chosen to make you captain of our team here for this season. We thank Him. And you and Lori are a beautiful team, just as 
God has ordained many times for Danny and I to say we are the Reese team and we stand in support of you. We uh, jump on the field and play with you and pray that God's truth, God's gospel will reach forth brightly from this church with the leadership and the support and the joy of the Lord that he is putting into all of us. We thank him and we praise him. We thank him and ask him to be with you in a mighty way. Father, Father we pray that um, ultimately, Lord, you would give strength, knowledge, wisdom, understanding to George in this new stage, in this new phase. And Father, we know that you have a plan and a purpose. You bring the pieces and you put them together according to your perfect plan and your will. And George is here for this time. Um, he's here for this time in our body, in our local body, and in your body to do a work. And we pray that you would give him the strength by your spirit to overcome the things that are going to be hurdles. I pray that you would give him patience and peace that come only from you. That in the things ahead, Lord, he would know what to do, and if not, he would cry out to you until he has the answers that he needs. And we pray for resolution of faith, to stand firm, to proclaim boldly the word of God and his truth, that he would continue to shine as a light into this community, into this area, Lord, that we would not be ashamed of your gospel, but would stand firm and continue to proclaim the truth to a lost and broken world. And we pray that your spirit would give him that power and wisdom and strength. I pray, Father, in his moments of weakness, you would just guard him. I pray, Father, that you would give us all sensitivity to pray for him. And that, Lord, we would all, as one body, be in support of him to help him accomplish the task that you have for him and for us. So, Lord, help us to be convicted, to be a part of this journey with him, to be able to stand beside him, to hold him up when things get difficult. And, Father, I pray that ultimately your work and your will would be done in our church, in his heart, in our lives, and we commit him to you, in Jesus' name. Yeah, if any of the other ladies want to go up, you should probably mute me now. Heavenly Father, I so agree with all the prayers that have gone up before. Ever grateful for your hand and how you have been moving in this congregation, in this body of believers. Thank you for the way you have answered our prayers for a new pastor and a new pastor's wife. Lord, we, we know, we recognize that they are indeed a team, but I lift up Lori specifically to you, echoing the other prayers for her, praying for a special measure of strength and grace, Lord, that as she faces base, some challenges that may come her way in her role, I pray that you will strengthen her and that we as a body of believers will surround her with encouragement, with exhortation, that we will not force her to live according to our own expectations, but that we lift her up to you with all confidence, with faith in your plan for her, and Lord, as we've prayed for protection for George and Lori, I see us all together strapping on new armor. We are not just a team, Lord. We are an army. And I pray that we would gather around in our hearts, if not physically, every single day that we arm ourselves according to what Ephesians 6 tells us. I think of Nehemiah and the wall that had to be rebuilt and that leaders stood in various places and entire families rebuilt the holes, rebuilt the structure, help our church to be just like that. 
and to also build up one another, to build up George and Lori. That it's all done for the glory of your name. That we can be that shining beacon in this community. That you will empower us to go out and be your light and your salt among those around us. That the kingdom would be proclaimed, the gospel preached. Thank you so much for George and Lori and their willingness to step up. Thank you for surrounding them. And thank you that you've given us the privilege of coming alongside of them. For it's in Jesus' name that we praise you and thank you. Amen. Thank you. Uh, we have three ways of giving here at Mid-Cities, uh, as you can see on the screen. Uh, give it via the realm. Uh, you can drop it in the boxes that we have back there. And do it the old-fashioned way, 3224 Cheeks Parker Road. And if you do the last one, we may get it in two weeks or so. I don't know. Uh, just a quick reminder, I don't want to go on and on and on about it. We all know what tithing is. This is God's house. And God's house is no different than our own personal homes. You know, we all have electric bills. We all have water bills. You know, it goes on and on and on and on. And we do need support. Let's go to the Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity even have in this building that we can come in and worship you. you all to stand with us here we have another song of worship beautiful truth amen that there is power in the blood amen
Saints are lost in its life giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you let daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. Precious blood of the Lamb, in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. Power in the blood, the Lamb of God. Amen. Everybody say, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. Amen. Amen. Well, closing announcements, you know the name of our church, Mid Cities Bible Church, and pray, pray the Lord would use us, all of us, his servants, for reaching the lost here. That we'll see souls. That though there is darkness in these days, there is light. Because the light of the world is Jesus Christ. And he uses us, he works through us, and there's more to come out of darkness. Amen? Amen. Daily word, portion of God's word every day. You read along there. Men's breakfast, mark that down, remember it. Also, QR code here. You can always scan it. Join right up at the realm. And remember to continue to pray. Poema Foundation. This work, the Lord to use it and rescue both physically and spiritually those children that are missing. Amen. Amen. Family feasting. So all are welcome to stay. We want to encourage you to please stay. In fact, uh, uh, I'm going to call one of the deacons. Ed, lock the door there. <laughs> We got plenty of food, fellowship, good time together here, and it's just uh, just enjoy this time together. And want to say the Lord bless you also, and use you in the week ahead. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed. We're ready to eat. <laughs>